Um, we are, uh, as, as Sean said, we are, we are entering, we are in the Christmas season already, part two of our series, uh, Unwrapping Christmas. And we've been talking about how Jesus is the greatest gift of all. And really, what does that mean? Because sometimes we can get caught up with the, the trappings of the season, the decorations, the parties, the fun, and all of that is, is great and it's amazing and we should enjoy it. But it's also meant to remind us of what God did for us in Christ. So that as we, as we culminate this year, really with Jesus, we can begin the next year living in the light of, of the revelation of who Jesus is in our lives, because that's where the power comes from. It doesn't come from just coming to church, but it comes from understanding who God is, what he's done in our lives, and letting that now live through us in our day-to-day interactions. And that starts by remembering who Jesus is, and, and uh, you know, that's really the greatest gift of all. And uh, so tonight, as we continue our series, we're going to do that. But before we do, I can't, you know, Christmas is really, it's nine days away. I don't know if you realize this. And um, if you haven't finished all your Christmas shopping yet, I have a tip for you. Um, I try to provide a service. And uh, I found out that one of the the, the greatest... uh, toys that kids want nowadays, what's going to be the hottest kids item, is this toy called Yellies. Anybody ever heard of, heard of Yellies? So basically, it's a toy that moves when kids scream at it. Have you seen this? Take a look at this commercial. Check this out right here. When I saw this commercial, I thought it was a joke, but it's real. And I am convinced that the person that invented this has never had a child. (laughs) And they may have never even seen a child because the last thing you want is for kids to be screaming all the time. So give this to someone that you love or hate, whichever. And if you hear kids screaming in your neighborhood, that's that's probably why. Um, The worst gift ever. Amen. Wouldn't you agree? And if anyone sends me yellies, you will be kicked out of the church forever. That's all I'm saying. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but the greatest gift ever is Jesus. See how I did that? See, that was the whole point of that right there. Worst gift ever, greatest gift ever is Jesus. And the, the passage that we've been looking at throughout this series, or in this series, is found in Isaiah chapter 9. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a prophecy that the prophet Isaiah gave about the coming Messiah. And if you were here last week, you remember that at the time, Israel was going through a really rough several hundred years. They were being oppressed by invading armies all around them. Their kings that were supposed to lead them into following God and obeying God, were they were immoral and they were leading them down a dark path, leading them really into God's judgment for worshiping idols and all kinds of other things. And so they were in a very desperate place. Is there any hope for us? Is there any hope for our future? Is there any hope for my kids? Is there any hope for my life? life. That's what they were crying out for. And in the midst of a hundred years of oppression, the God gives the prophet Isaiah this word about the Messiah, the Savior who's going to come. And we know several thousand years later that his name was Jesus. But this is what it says about the coming Messiah. And this is where we'll begin this evening. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of of peace. Last week we talked about how Jesus is the wonderful counselor, and tonight we're going to talk about the fact that he is the mighty God. And when you think about the fact that they needed this kind of hope, well, what is the hope that, that, that God is, that the Messiah is going to bring? Well, one of the things that we recognize is that he is not just a prophet, he's not just a teacher, he is in fact the mighty God. And in your notes here it says this, Jesus is creator of all, light to all, and Lord of all. He's the creator of all, and we touched on this last week if you were here, but he also wants to be the light to all and a Lord and the Lord of all. Let's look at what it says here in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He wasn't just, you know, a force. He wasn't just, you know, an idea or a good teacher. He was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. God sent his son Jesus to the world to lead us into the light and into the life that he's created for us to live. All of us, as we live our lives, we experience a certain amount of darkness. Isn't that true? All of us, whether it's the way that you grew up or circumstances that happened in your life, we all experience darkness because the Bible tells us that there's a very real devil that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God has a purpose and a destiny for us. He created us for a reason, gifted us with with talents and abilities and passions to fulfill on this earth. But what the devil does is he comes to bring darkness to cover that. 
so that we don't become the people that God's called us to be. We don't live the life that he's created for us to live, and instead we experience darkness. And many of you have experienced darkness in your life growing up, and, and, and whether it was with your parents being divorced or something has happened or whether it's a death in the family or something, all of us have experienced a certain amount of darkness that then causes our destiny to be shifted. You see that? But that wasn't God's purpose. That's not his plan. He's not the author of evil and the author of pain. That's what, that's what the enemy's doing. But here's what God did. He looked down from heaven and saw the state of humanity broken and in darkness. He said, I'm going to send my son Jesus to be the light of the world, to lead people into the life that I've created for them to live. And so when the Bible speaks about Jesus as the, as the wonderful counselor that we talked about last week and the mighty God, is that he's come to be mighty and strong in your life. And maybe you're here tonight and you, you're facing some darkness. You're facing some challenges. You're facing some obstacles and issues. Can I tell you that there is no situation that is so dark that Jesus can't bring his light into? There's no situation in your life that is so broken that God can't repair by his power. But that begins by us making Jesus Lord. And when we make him Lord, his light enters our life and he begins to guide us and lead us into the life that he's created for us to live. And I got to tell you that it's not just coming to church. As happy as I am that you're here, you didn't have to be. And as, 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 as pleased as we are that, you know, you're, you come to church, that's just the first step of inviting Jesus into your life so that that light now can lead us into the life that he's created for us to live. But that begins, it should begin a process of lordship, which we're going to talk about tonight, where we systematically begin to put every area of our life under the lordship of Christ, letting him lead us. No longer us leading ourselves, but saying, Jesus, by your word, lead me into living the life that you've created for me to live, because that's where God's blessing is. God's blessing isn't where we're living in sin and disobedience. God's blessing is when we're obeying him and we're walking under his lordship. And that's when his power begins to work in our lives. And we begin to see his purpose begin to be fulfilled in our lives. But he's the creator of all. We understand that. He's God, right? He wants to be a light into your life. And that happens as we make him Lord. You know, I, you know, I remember I was reading the Christmas story to my son, and, and, and we have this picture Bible thing, and I was showing him, you know, and Jesus in the manger, and, and I said, you know, that's, that's the Son of God. That's one of the things that it said. And, and my, my son Michael was like, how can God, the creator of the universe, be the baby? Like, he, that didn't, he couldn't wrap his mind around that, because we had just had McKenna, and she was a baby in her crib, and he's like, how can God be a baby? And, and you know, that, that should kind of blow your mind a little bit, that, that the creator of the universe would choose to wrap himself in his creation. Think about that. Like, I don't know that, if, again, if I was God, I would, there's no way I would do that. I'd be up in heaven, like, you know, telling y'all what to do, you know. But that's not how God is. He entered into our experience so that he could live amongst us, so that he could live the life that we could not live for ourselves holy and be victorious over sin, so that he could show us the way, be the light, but also to die in our place on the cross. What kind of God would do that? And in the ancient world, there was no concept of the gods being benevolent and loving as that. And Jesus comes to demonstrate to us what God is like. And many times in our lives, we think that God is far away, uncaring, and unloving. But Christmas reminds us that, no, he, he's loving, and he came near. He came close so that he can be the light to our lives as we make him Lord. And so every single one of us have areas of our lives that we want to change. Isn't that true? Every, every one of us has areas of our lives that we wish, man, God, if you could work in this area, this area of brokenness, or this area of pain. And maybe some of you can think of people that you wish would change. Right? Amen? Don't, hopefully don't, they're not sitting next to you. Uh, but all of us have, have areas that we, we, we need God's power to bring change and transformation. Can I tell you where that starts? It starts as when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of our lives. Um, Jesus didn't stay a baby, though. He grew up, and as I said, to, to, to show us the way to life. And this one instance here, he really demonstrated the fact that he really is the mighty God. And it's found in John chapter 11, verse 38 to 44, and I'm going to read it for us. and It'll be up on screen. This is arguably the culmination of Jesus' miracles on earth. He performed a lot of miracles, healed a lot of people, did a lot of amazing stuff. And those miracles were to show us who he was, that he really is God. He's not just some moral teacher like Socrates or Aristotle or Plato. He wasn't just some, some philosopher or even just a prophet like Moses. No, he was God. And his miracles show us that. And this one in particular was the culmination of it uh, in, his, in his life and his ministry. John chapter 11, verse 38. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb, it says, because it was where his friend Lazarus was buried. He had died a little over four days before this moment. They buried him. They, first, they embalmed him, wrapped his body up, put him in the tomb, and they rolled a stone over it. Okay, so Jesus deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor because he had been there for four days. How many of you know he wasn't just dead? He was good and dead. 
He was in that tomb for four days. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew, I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out with his hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus just called a dead man back to life. And this moment was so significant that word about it spread. I mean, obviously, if, you know, you know someone's calling a dead man out of the tomb, word's going to spread. You know, in a day without social media, it still spread pretty fast because this was in an outpost kind of a town. And word got all the way to Jerusalem so that just a few weeks later when Jesus enters Jerusalem, tens of thousands of people crowded the streets shouting Hosanna. In other words, Messiah. They were praising the Messiah because they recognized that Jesus was the Messiah because he had raised the dead man to life. There was no longer any question in people's minds who Jesus was. And not that he was just some teacher, that's what some people said. Not that he was just some prophet, that's what some people said. After he raised Lazarus from the dead, tens of thousands of people rushed to meet him as he entered Jerusalem because they knew he was God. They knew that he was the Messiah, and they came to worship him. Jesus wants to demonstrate in our lives who he is, that he is the mighty God. And as we trust him and place our lives under his lordship, man, there is no area of our lives that God cannot bring back to life. If God can bring, Jesus can bring back a dead man, that area in your life that you said is dead and there's no hope in, I, I believe Jesus can breathe life into that as well. Can I hear an amen to that? Sometimes we look at our lives and we say, no, this is too broken. No, this is too hard. There's no way God can come through here. There's no way God can breathe life into this situation, this relationship, this problem, this circumstance. And if he can breathe life into a dead man, bring him back to life, there is no area that is so dark, so broken, so dead that Jesus cannot resurrect. Can I hear an amen to that? And Jesus' miracle should remind us of that. And the question, and I, and I always say this, the question is not, can God do something in this area of my life? The question is not, can God bring healing and transformation in this area? The question very often is, it's not, can God? The question is, will we trust him and will we follow him with our lives? And I'm not just talking about, I go to church on Sunday, because that doesn't necessarily mean that you follow him with your life from Monday to Saturday. Listen, when I first started coming to church, yeah, I, I, I believed in Jesus, man. Jesus was awesome. He was great. But there were areas of my life that I did not surrender to his lordship. One of those areas was relationships. I kept on dating different girls and all this different stuff. And, and, I, and I'd come to church on Sunday and go, praise the Lord. I love you, Jesus. But in the back from Monday to Saturday, they, they, there were things going on that was not surrendered to his lordship. And I remember after, after one, one relationship didn't go so well, I began to realize, God, what am I doing? How can I come here on Sunday and give you praise and, and call you my Lord, but Monday through Saturday, I'm doing whatever I want, not even consulting you or your word in it. And I want you to bless my life. And I realize the contradiction there, that I can't call him Lord on Sunday if he's not really my Lord from Monday to Saturday. And every single one of us have areas in our lives where he is not fully Lord. And therefore, we can't expect the power of the mighty God to work in our lives if we haven't fully surrendered our lives to him. And sometimes I think God is, is waiting to pour out his, his, his presence, his power, his grace in us, but, he, but he's not going to do that until we fully give our lives over to him. And we can get as mad at God as we want. We can get frustrated and shake our fists at heaven, but really God's going, but you're not surrendered to my lordship. Why would you expect me to work in that era of your life? And every one of us in our lives, I, I, even this, this evening as we're here, I'm sure there are some areas of our lives that we're struggling to really surrender to Christ's lordship. And this evening, I want to encourage you that I don't want to make anyone feel guilty or condemned, but challenged and maybe convicted because I think the mighty God up in heaven wants to work powerfully in your life. I really do. But he's not going to do it if we're withholding our lives from him. He's not going to do it if we, we, we worship him with our lips, but not truly with our lives. Look at what it says here. Um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I don't take it back. Um, he, in your notes, it says, as we make Jesus Lord of all, his power works in us. When we make him Lord of all, his power begins to work in us. What area of your life right now is that area that you're kind of withholding and, you're, and you haven't fully surrendered to him? Because again, the issue is not can God work. The issue is will we fully trust him with our lives? Will we fully trust the lordship and the power of this mighty God that ultimately he knows what's best? That he who loves us most knows what's best for us. Do we trust him? And when I think about this, you know, this whole idea of surrendering our lives to his lordship. You know, I used to think, you know, when I, when I first started coming to church, there were a lot of things in my life that was broken. At the time, my dad was in jail. There was just a lot of pain and frustration. I was dealing with a lot of loneliness, insecurity, depression. And, and so, I, so, I, so I coped with relationships. 
I figured if I had a girl that liked me, I must be doing okay, right? I mean, I know many of us do that. But, but that was, went from one relationship to the next, and I was, just, I was just chronically unhappy. And I remember when I started coming to church, I said, God, all right, take over my life, right? I give you full control. Just take over. And here's what I wanted him to do. I wanted him to, like, just drive my life like, like a Tesla autopilot. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I just want to kick back, and you drive me, you take me to wherever you want me to go, and just drop me off. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to have to think about it. I don't want to have to do anything about it. Just drive my life. Jesus, take the wheel. You know what I'm saying? But you know what? I began to realize after a period of time that that's not how God works. God's not going to just come into your life and take over and, like, you know, be your Uber driver and just, you know what I mean? He doesn't do that. What he wants to do is change our hearts so that we willingly follow him. He's not going to take over. And so I was praying, Jesus, take over. Jesus, change me, change me, change me. And I began to get frustrated. How come I'm not changing? Because God's not going to just take over your life. He wants to change our hearts again so that we willingly follow him. So it's not like a Tesla autopilot, which I would love to have in real life, but uh, nonetheless. I, I began to realize the way that God works is a lot more like GPS or like Google Maps on your phone. You know what I'm talking about? Like... Google makes suggestions, turn here, and you can go, nah, that's a stupid idea. I have a better way to get there, right? How many of you have ever done that, yeah? Turn here, right? <laughs> right turn, and you're like, nah, that's dumb. I'm going to go this way, and then you're like, oh, shoot, and you realize, you know, you got to turn around and go back, right? I realize it's a lot more like that. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit and his word, is directing us, turn here, right? Make this decision here. Make this turn here. Forgive that person there. You know what I'm saying? This, that, and the other thing, and we can go, nah, I'm going to do it my way. Or we can go, all right, I trust you. And I remember the first time I got Google Maps on my phone and I went to someplace I didn't know and I was driving. I, I, I didn't fully trust her. You know what I'm talking about? Because she talks with a British accent and that's just weird, first of all, right? <laughs> and so I made sure I had a paper map as well. Y'all remember those things? Yeah, I know. Anyway, there's, there's this book. It was a map of everything. And I made sure I had that and I double checked. I just wanted to make sure you did Google, you know where you're taking me. And now Siri, you know, she's, she's, she's a little worse, but nonetheless. And so I, she's gotten better over the years, though. Um, so I didn't fully trust the Google map. You know what I'm talking about? But you know what? After trip after trip, after she's led me to the right place more times than, than not, I don't even think about it anymore. I can go any place in the country, any place around the world, and I'll just tell Google where I want to go, and she tells me how to get there. And I trust her advice. Why? Because you've shown me that you know, you know better than I do. You've shown me that you know how to get to my destination way better than I do. So now I don't even think about it. Google, here's where I want to go. Bam, and you go. Isn't that true? You don't even think about it anymore. Why is it? Because you, we know that it knows best. Well, how much greater than our Google map is the Holy Spirit in our lives? He knows what's best for us. He loves us most, and he knows what's best. We got to just stop trusting in our own wisdom and our own intellect and our own opinions of how things ought to go and say, God, I trust you. And, and, I, and when I say I surrender, I'm not expecting you to take over. I'm going to trust your word. If you tell me to turn right, I'm going to turn right. You tell me I need to forgive that person, I'm going to forgive that person. You tell me I need to be generous, then I'm going to be generous. You tell me I need to, to lay down these relationships that aren't bearing fruit in my life, then I will lay it down. He wants us to learn to willingly trust him because we understand how much he loves us and that he knows what's best for our lives. And so every single one of us have areas in our lives that we're withholding because we think we know what's best. Or we're worried that he's not going to lead us to the place that we want to go. That's where trust comes in. And when we look at the gospel that Jesus came to lay his life down for us, he loves us, he knows what's best, and he has a plan and a purpose for us, then we know that we can trust him because I know that you know what's best. That's what lordship is. It's choosing to trust in the leadership of Jesus in our lives. Whatever of your life are you withholding, fully surrendering to him? Because that's, that might be the area of your life that's holding back the purpose of God and the power of God from flowing in and through your life. What area of your life are you struggling with? It's, a lot of times we can, we can identify it as the areas where we say no to God, right? No, God, I'm not going to do that. No, God, I'm not going to obey you there. You know, those are the obvious ones that we can identify, right, where, where Jesus is calling us to obey his word in some way, shape, or form, and we go, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to forgive. No, I'm not going to obey. No, I'm not going to whatever, right? That, 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 that's definitely an area that's not surrendered to his lordship. But it's also the areas of our lives where we keep on slipping up in, where we've said yes in the past, but we keep on tripping up. Now, I don't, wanna, I don't want anyone to feel condemned again because I don't think God is condemning us, but here's what he's doing. He's inviting us into his lordship. He's inviting us into the life that he's created for us to live. He's saying, if you'll trust me, if you'll follow me, I'm going to take you some places. If you'll trust me, if you'll follow me, I'll work in your life. And I remember when I was 
in high school, and like I said, the area of relationships, I didn't surrender to his lordship. And I remember after, after one relationship didn't go so well, again, I was coming to church. I began to realize, man, my leadership in my life sucks. Like, I'm not doing a very good job at this, so God, I fully trust you in it. I trust you. And I went a long period of time where I didn't get into relationships because I kept on leading myself astray and hurting people along the way, by the way. I began to realize, God, no, I'm going to fully trust you in this area of my life. And I'm so glad that I did because he knew what was best for me. And he led me to my wife and into the relationship with her that I have now and the kids that I have now. And I'm so glad that I didn't keep on trying to figure things out on my own, but instead I began to trust in him and his word to lead me and guide me. What area of your life right now do you find yourself not surrendered to his lordship? I want to invite you, as the Holy Spirit invites you, to trust him. Because he who loves us most knows what's best. Trust him and his lordship in our lives. Luke 6, 46 says this, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus asking, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? You call me Lord, but you're not doing what I say. So really, I'm not Lord. And a lot of times, we like this idea of Jesus as Savior. Yes, save me from hell. Save me from sin. Save me from this. But we got to realize that Jesus is not just Savior. He is both Lord and Savior together. We can't separate the two. We can't say, I love this Savior part, but this Lord part, huh, man, I'm not too, too fond of that because, you know, because of this area of my life that I don't want to change and that area of my life that I don't want to change. Well, here's the reality. If we don't make him Lord, then he's not Savior neither. You follow, you follow me? If he's not really your Lord, then he's not your Savior. And then we can't get mad at God when he's not doing what you want him to do. He's not your Lord. He's not your Savior. What, what are you mad about? If you want to be your Lord, then great. Do things your way. But if we trust in him as Lord, he will also be Savior. He's both and, amen? Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? He's got to be both. So he first wants to work in us, and that's where we begin. That's what just starts where we trust him. And again, he's not, he doesn't want to force us into obedience. He wants to invite us into the life that he's created for us to live. He's inviting us into his lordship because that's where his power lies. And then secondly, we see as we make Jesus Lord of all, his power works for us. This is awesome. This is the stuff that we want. We want him to work for us. We first have to let him work in us. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What is the Apostle Paul talking about? He's writing this from a jail cell that he was put in for preaching the gospel. And he recognized these circumstances that were outside of his control to the natural seem horrible, right? You're in prison for preaching the gospel. That's terrible. That's not fair. These are circumstances far out of his control. But he began to recognize something, that God, you're doing something greater even than what I can't see here. And as he continued to surrender to Christ's lordship in the matter, God began to use what seemed like a bad situation for the good. And that's what he's talking about here. Even when I am weak, God, you show yourself to be strong in my life. Even in these bad circumstances, you orchestrate it and you turn it around for my good. And we can trust even in the weaknesses and in the trial that God is working for us. What situation in your life are you, you walking through where you need God to work for you? You need God's power to show up and begin to work in certain things that we can't control on our own. I remember when I first started coming to church, as I shared, you know, I was, I was learning to follow Christ and his lordship. And one of, the, one of the major situations, if you've been around for a little while, you probably heard the story already, but my dad was in jail. And, I, and, I, and I, he was a drug dealer, and my whole life, I didn't really want anything to do with him. And at this point, I started coming to church. I started trusting in Christ's lordship. But in, it, but in my heart, I was like, I don't want anything to do with my dad. I didn't expect to ever see him again. I didn't expect anything to happen with our relationship. I just kind of given up on it. It was dead. You know what I'm saying? It was Lazarus in the tomb. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to have anything else to do with this. It's done. It's over. And, and I forgot all about it for a good long time. But as I began to grow in my relationship with God, different leaders and pastors and other men were telling me, you know what? You should start praying for your dad. And I remember the first time they told me that, I was like, I ain't praying for him. He needs to pray for himself. You know what I'm saying? That's what was going on in my mind. You know, I ain't praying for him. But that was an area I needed to surrender to his lordship, this issue of forgiveness. And I remember one of our, my youth pastor at the time, he told me, you need to forgive him. You need to forgive your dad. And I was like, forgive him? He's never said sorry. You know what I'm saying? He's never, and in my mind, I'll, I'll forgive him. This is why I, I think I said this out loud over the phone. I'll forgive him when he grovels on his hands and his knees and begs for it. That was what was going on in my mind. That era of my life wasn't surrendered to the lordship of Christ. So my pastor met with me, and he showed me scriptures about forgiveness. I was like, I don't like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I need to forgive him? No. 
I need to forgive him even though he's never asked for forgiveness? And then I remember this one particular moment, he, this pastor he shared with me, he said, you know, you realize that God offered his forgiveness to you before you asked for it. Jesus died for you before you asked for it. He, you never asked for him to die for you, and he offered his forgiveness to you before he asked, you asked for it. So you need to forgive your dad even before he asked for it. Can I tell you, that pierced me <laughs> because that era of my life was, I had said, no, I'm, not, I'm gonna do this my way. I'm not gonna forgive him. And I don't care what your word says. I'm not gonna forgive him. But I had to wrestle with that. And some of you are wrestling with some areas of your life right now. But as I, as I did, and I chose to say, all right, God, I choose to forgive. I choose because your word says so, not because he asked for it, not because he deserved it, but simply because this Bible says so, then I'm going to do it. And I chose to forgive him. And I chose to forgive him over and over and over again in my heart and out loud. And you know what God began to do? He began to work for me in ways that I had never expected. He began to work in my relationships around me. He began to work in my dad, and I had no idea. And I tell the story. I got a phone call one day, and it was from Halava Prison. Where, where my dad was. And, 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 and this, is, this is now months, probably several months, if not a year after I had decided to forgive him. And he called and he apologized. He said, son, I'm sorry for all that I did to you and your mom. And I want to let you know I gave my life to the Lord here in prison. And, and I'm sorry. And I love you. You know what I mean? Years, about, you know, months later, probably about a year later, after I made that decision to surrender this area of my life to his lordship, God began to work for me. And now fast forward from that moment on 10, a little over 10 years later, we began to reconcile and we have a great relationship today. And many of you know he works on our staff as our operations director here in the mornings. God has done stuff that I could never do for myself. And I'm convinced that if you'll surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ, there are things like that, testimonies like that, that God wants to write in your life. Stuff that you've said, no, it's dead, it's buried. The stone's rolled over, it's over. God can't do anything with this. If you will surrender to the Lordship of Christ in every area of your life, I'm convinced that there is nothing in that tomb that God can't bring back to life. And maybe you don't even want it to come back to life right now. I didn't really want it to come back to life. But you know what? I'm so glad that God did. Because my kids now have their grandfather. I have my dad around. And many of you have areas of your life that are so broken, so dead. God wants to breathe back to life. But he's waiting for us to surrender to his Lordship so that he can work for us. Can I hear an amen to that? Whatever of your life tonight, do you need the power of God to breathe his life into? Next week, Sunday, at Christmas service, you're going to hear live uh, the testimony of one of our young adults, uh, Jansen Ukol. He shared with me this morning at, at 11.15, and you'll hear him live next week. Um, but he, you know, went had a lot of trauma as a young kid. Uh, his father was abusive, and that led him to wanting to commit suicide in the eighth grade and ended up living on the streets in San Francisco and living a lifestyle that was totally opposite to God's word on drugs and alcohol and, and, and all this kind of stuff. But he came to a point where he surrendered his life fully to Jesus, and Jesus began to change him and transform him. And to the point where now he's making a difference in the lives of others, and God's totally turned the page in his life over to another, to another, to, to the, probably closer to the purpose of God for his life. The devil wanted to destroy him when he was young, and God said, if you'll trust me, I will fix all of that. I will restore all of that. And you'll hear him live next week, so that's a little commercial. But what area of your life do you need Jesus to breathe his life into? Do you need the mighty God to show up? Surrender to his lordship, and I'm convinced that you haven't seen anything yet. As we make Jesus Lord of all, his power works in us, it works for us, and then thirdly, his, his power works through us. His power works through us, right? The power of God, the Holy Spirit is never meant to just be, be, be kept up in, in us, but it's meant to flow through us into the lives of, of people all around us. And, and uh, Acts 1.8 says this, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when, you, when, you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when you receive Jesus, and you will be my witnesses. That word witness in the original language means a living demonstration. You're going to be a living demonstration of my love to people everywhere, showing people everywhere the love of Christ. See, the power of God is not just meant to change us as awesome as that is. It's meant to flow through us like a river, not like a, a lake that just contains it all, but a river that flows through us. And I've, and, I, and I've seen it, it's, it's like a cycle, right? We let Jesus work in us, we let him work for us, and then he works through us, and then he continues to work in us, for us, and through us. And this is this ongoing cycle of the Holy Spirit working in and through every single one of our lives. But that starts when we say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you fully, every area of my life. I'm not going to hold anything back from you anymore. And tonight, as we, as, we could, as we journey on in this series, what is that area of your life that you've been holding back from God? 
And again, I don't want anyone to feel condemned, but challenged that the Holy Spirit is inviting you into a deeper walk with Jesus, a deeper walk in his power, a deeper walk in experiencing his love and his power in and through our lives. God's power has to work through us because as great as, as a Christmas season is for a lot of people, you know, we're celebrating, we're having a lot of fun. It's also a tough time for a lot of people. Isn't that true? Because it just reminds us of what we don't have very often. It reminds us of the pain and the, and, and, and the loss and, and, and the stuff that's going on in our lives. And you see pictures of people and what they're doing on Christmas time. And th this was me. Man, I'm so glad I didn't grow up with social media, by the way. Because when I was in high school, it wasn't a good time. Christmas was not a good time. I think I shared this with you guys before. But I remember my, my dad was in jail. I had just started coming to church. And my mom... Uh, she tore her ACL when she was in the mainland skiing. So she ended up staying in the mainland with her boyfriend for like, I think it was like six months. And part of that time was during Christmas time. So I was home by myself. And there's this one Christmas, I was home by myself, just me and my dog, Cleo. <laughs> She's a poodle. Anyway, uh, just me and my dog. And I was feeling so sorry for myself. And I, I just started coming to church. I was like, God, why am I going through this? Why am I alone? Why is all this happening? I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to give my life to you, but why, why is it like this? And I was so sad. I went to I went to Dae, bought a Christmas tree by myself, set it up by myself, bought my dog a gift, and we sat there Christmas morning, open Christmas presents, just me and my dog. I know, sad. But it made me, but, it, but, it, but, it, but it, it was tough, and it was a really dark time. And I thought about, you know, years when I was, when I was a kid, how great it used to be, and now how crappy it is. I remember when I was five years old, before my parents got divorced, before my dad got arrested, and how great Christmases were, and now how terrible it is, and I thought, God, this sucks. There's a lot of people like that. Maybe some of you right now. Christmas isn't a great time for you. This is a really difficult time. Can I tell you that even that may be where you are right now, if you trust in his lordship, that's not where you're going to be down the road. But God will take this, and he will turn it, and he will, you, it's just the beginning of what God will do in your life, but you've got to start trusting in him. So I remember I was feeling all sorry for myself, opened Christmas presents with my dog. I didn't have very many, but one of those Christmas presents was a Bible. My pastor gave me a Bible, a brand new Bible. And I felt like the Lord say, this is what this is about. Start with me. Make it about me. And as you trust in me, <laughs> this is the last Christmas you're going to have to go through this. And it really was. That was the last time. And from then on, God began to do an amazing work in my life. And I'm convinced it's not just because of me. I'm nobody special. He wants to do that in every single one of our lives if we'll trust in him. His power wants to work in us, for us, and through us. But it starts when we look at this word and we say, all right, yes, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. Yes to your word. Wherever you tell me to turn, I'll turn. Wherever you tell me to go, I'll turn. You want me to make a U-turn? I'll make a U-turn. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. But I trust you that you love me and you know what's best for me. I surrender to your Lordship in every area. As you do that, watch what God does in your life. I promise you, this is just the beginning if you'll begin to trust in him. Amen.